presenting The Gals They Left Behind, starring Shirley Booth and Helen Clare on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Before we begin our play, here's an interesting news note on how chemical science is helping to solve the food shortage problem for animals. Cattle and sheep need a certain amount of protein in their diets, just as we do, and protein scarce. Now, two 62 feed compound containing urea, a product of chemistry, takes the place of its necessary protein in mixed feeds for cattle and sheep. Chemistry is helping to solve this critical wartime feed problem and so help bring more food to your own table. And now, for our play. This evening, the Cavalcade of America turns the spotlight on still another aspect of American life in the summer of 1944. At present, our concern is with the home front, which is marching in spirit beside the men who fight. This great army, composed of wives, mothers, and sweethearts of America's men, might well be called an army of occupation because they are truly occupied with waiting, working, praying for their sons and husbands. It is these women Cavalcade salutes in the radio adaptation by Edith Sommer of the just-published book by Margaret Shea, The Gals They Left Behind, The Authentic Experiences of Two Soldiers' Wives. The DuPont Company presents Shirley Booth as Joe Sullivan and Helen Clare as Taffy Smith in a tribute to the Corporal Sullivans and Private Smiths of this war, and more specifically to the gals they left behind. Never thought the old car would make it. Come on, Joe. Let's get out and look at it. Oh, no. Oh, no. This can't be Great Aunt Hetch's farm. She didn't like you, maybe, and willed it to you as a kind of a grim joke, maybe. It's funny, Taffy, but it didn't look like this when I was a little girl. Then I thought it was wonderful. You know, we smelled of gingerbread and pickle lily and geraniums with a little spicy dash of cow and clover floating in from the barn. And now it just smells. The house does lurch a bit, doesn't it? Lurch? Joe, it's a dump. That's what it is. A big, horrible old dump. That's what it is. And that, dearest Bill, was what it was. Of course, I'll write you more when we get settled. But right now, the big news is Taffy and I arrived in Housecroft, Maine this morning, bag and baggage. Taffy's harmonica included. It's a cinch, darling. Manhattan was never like this. But then you probably felt the same when you and Hank arrived in New Caledonia. It's a far cry from our little apartment on 61st Street, Bill, because, well, you know what I mean. But I couldn't let Taffy know how I felt when she said... Joe, it's a dump. That's what it is. A big, horrible old dump. See here, Taffy Smith. You're homesick for Hank. That's what's the matter with you. And that's all that's the matter. Oh. Now stop crying. Because if you don't... Well, if you don't... I'm going to start. Hey! What's that? Uh, birds. Oh. Singing. Oh. There's not another human being within miles. Ooh. Oh, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, you ain't ones for courage, are you? Too much city living, I reckon. I take it you're the women folks that's aiming to take over this here Perkins place. Huh? That's right. And who are you? Either of you a kin of that hellcat? Certainly not. Which hellcat? Het Perkins. That's which. Yeah. Old Het kept me in land courts all the time with them boundaries of her. And if you got any of her blood, little lady... You better get stepping back down south where you come from. Yeah. Your name, sir? Ma'am, my name is Hard Clough. I didn't mean scare you girls, no. Well, but... you certainly did. Oh, wait a minute, Kathy. I know I'm a churl to bring it up, 
but it occurs to me that you are on our land, Mr. Hart. The name is Mr. Clough. Well, Mr. Clough. And another thing. All right, all right, all right. Might have known I couldn't beat nobody that's kin to old Het. <laughs> Great old lady she was. She could spit words further than I could spit tobacco. See what I mean? Well, good day to you. Bye. Now, if you need anything and you wait long enough, I'll probably be by to help you out sooner or later. Maybe. And by the way, I wouldn't use your well water, was I you? Leastways, not the way it is. Why not? Got a muskrat into it. A what? Yeah. I throwed it in myself. Well, I didn't know you was coming. Well, what do we do? We can't drink water that's got a muskrat in it. It's dangerous. We might get hurt. No, ma'am. That muskrat won't hurt you. He's dead. Oh, look now, Joe. This is insane. We're not here two minutes, and already we're poisoned to death by the well water. Joe, let's go back to New York. Now, wait a minute, ma'am. If you just put the boil to that water, it'll be all right. Might smell a mite, but that ain't going to hurt you. Just put the boil to it. Well, I guess I'll be going along. Goodbye now. Hope you two girls have a nice time here. I don't think you will, but I hope you do. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. But even so, Bill, we'll make out all right, I think. But, darling, we've got rooms crammed with Boston rockers, old calendars, marble top commodes. And not a Fifth Avenue bus in sight. These are facts, my darling, not complaints. Oh, I'd meant to write you such gay, dashing letters. I will tomorrow, Bill, honest. Tonight, I can. Tonight, something's happened to the starch in my stiff upper lip. I miss you. You're Joe. P.S. Uh, before we went to bed tonight, Kathy and I paid a visit to our well with a pitchfork. And we buried the muskrat in the front yard. I just thought you'd like to know. Joe. Joe. Joe, you sleep? Uh uh. Me either. The moon's in my eyes. Well, turn over. It doesn't do any good. Gosh, the night's so soft and warm and mellow. And you ain't hit bed so big. Mm. Those hands. What? Big. He's big. I bet my husband is the biggest, strongest man. Joe. Mm. You know what I'm thinking? Mm-hmm. He's been gone so long. I know, Kathy. You know, at a time like this, being from New England must be a great comfort to you. For heaven's sake, why? Because you can be so brave about Bill's being off in New Caledonia, 9,545 miles away. Think of something else, Taffy, quick. But I don't want to think of something else. I just want to think about Hank. Now, Taffy, stop it. You're just being silly. What would Hank think if he knew? He'd love it. Oh, Kathy, for heaven's sake. The trouble with you is you haven't got any heart. I don't think you even care that Bill's away out fighting the war. I don't think you even miss him. Oh, what's that? What's the matter? There's, there's something in this bag. Here, give it to me. Now, wait a minute. It's... Why, it's a pipe. A man's pipe. Yes, I know. Because it's Bill's. Bill? He but, forgot it when he went away. Well, I know, but... He's I... always smoking it, and now... Well, I, I like to keep it with me. It's sort of a talisman. When I think I can't stand the thought of his being away another minute, well, I just look at the pipe and remember how Bill smiled and how he kissed me and... <laughs> Taffy Smith, if you laugh or say one word... Joe. I'll... Now, come on, Taffy. No more talking. We've got to get to sleep. There's a lot of work to be done tomorrow. Joe... And... What is it? Would you... Would you mind if we held hands? I know it sounds childish. No. But... No, I wouldn't mind. Night, Joe. Night, Kathy. Dearest Bill... 
It's April 26th now, and already we've got 12 laying hens, a dog, a cow, and a little girl. The dog's Amy, a lovely dog. She's deaf, poor thing, but it's all right. She doesn't know it. Now, uh, now Eloise, the little girl, well, that's another proposition. She's nine years old, and her favorite author is Edgar Allan Poe. She's the offspring of Doris and Jake Ware, both overseas. So we have Eloise, who does needlepoint, reads editorials in the Times, and loves to improve people. Best of all, she loves to improve people. Well, the first thing she said to me was, May I try to do something about your hair someday, Mrs. Sullivan? It's so unfair the way you do it. You see what I mean? But we have a fine time, though. Tabby plays a harmonica, and Eloise uh, helps me feed the chickens and scrub the house. And this summer, we'll be eating our own vegetables and drinking milk from our own cow. Oh, Bill, she's such a lovely cow. Brown and white, and her name's Rosie. Hard Clough brought her over this evening and showed me how to milk her. Tomorrow morning at five, I do it alone. I know just how I'll do it. I'll be calm and efficient. First, I shall gently lead Rosie into the barn. And then... Come on, Rosie. Come on. That's a good cow. That's it. That's the way. Oh, what a fine, beautiful cow. Come on now, just a little bit more. A little more. What do you Come mean, on. just a little bit more? She hadn't moved an inch. Well, I'm trying to make her think she has. Oh, Joe. But if you <laughs> Eloise would stop giggling at me, maybe I could think of something. As it is, you both just stand there. If it was I, Mrs. Sullivan, I'd offer her something to eat. Seems logical she'd follow you then. Eloise, you're terrific. Look, Rosie, here's some nice pieces of feed. Come on, you brown and white prima donna. Get going. <laughs> Look, Joe, she's moving. Atta go, Rosie. Eloise, you're an angel. Oh, not at all. It was only logical. Okay, Joe, Rosie's all fit. You ready? Oh, yes, yes, I think so. The three-legged stool, the pail, the warm one. Yes. All right, now. Quiet, everybody. Eloise, begin. How to Milk a Cow, Chapter 1, Page 3. Go on, Eloise. The first step in successfully milking a cow is to wash it with warm water. You mean all over? Oh, Kathy, for heaven's sake. Go on, Eloise. Recently, a new method for milking has been innovated. Experts now advise you to complete the task within four minutes. This is because of the inactive condition of the hormone back at the fourth minute. Eloise, what do I do right now? For the neophyte, it is advised that the thumb and index finger of each hand be used. A steady pressure is also advised. Now, after... Tell me that again now, slowly. For the neophyte, it is advised that the thumb and index finger of each hand be used. A steady pressure is also advised. Nothing's happening. I'm I'm doing it. Nothing's happening. Last night, it worked all right. I don't understand. Oh, my gosh, Joe, look at Rosie. She's dying. Just keep calm, Taffy. You've got to keep calm. She's not dying. She's sneezing. But you're hurt now. Don't pull so hard. Joe, look out. I tell you. To wit, the cow. On no account should the cow be excited during milking. Am I going too fast for you? Eloise, I should just... Joe? Oh, all right. But don't just stand there. Help me out. Okay. Here. Listen, Joe, Rosie doesn't look right. I think she's going to charge or something. Her eyes are red, Joe. Maybe she's part bull. Kathy, where's your harmonica? Get it out. Hurry. But why? Never mind. Get it out. And play something. Anything. Oh, now look here, Joe. Kathy, this is a matter of life and death. Go on, play. Well, if you think. It's working. I think it's working. Go on, Kathy, go on. Kathy. Kathy, she's milking. Rosie's milking. Well, of course she's milking. It's only logical. As the book says. Eloise. Yes. 
Come here a minute, dear. If anybody had asked me, I could have told them that music has a mesmerizing effect on animals. And I could have told you that it was the... Oh, you... You spanked me. Well, forgive me, Eloise, but it, it seems so darn logical. Come on, Taffy. Strike up the band. You are listening to The Gals They Left Behind, starring Shirley Booth and Helen Clare on The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Joe Sullivan and Taffy Smith, the gals they left behind, have given up New York City for an old farmhouse in Maine. So far, they've learned to cope with chickens, milk a cow, and grow vegetables. As our cavalcade play continues, Joe and Taffy, played by Shirley Booth and Helen Clare, and their ward for the duration, nine-year-old Eloise, prepare to meet the new year and the problems it will undoubtedly bring. Dear Estelle... It's New Year's Eve. Taffy's over by the stove playing her harmonica. And I'm trying to put down on paper thoughts that... So don't waste a penny on them, dear. They're all yours. We're three lonely old women up here. Eloise, Taffy, and I, but... Well, we've done all right, I guess. Our cellar's stocked with food. We've grown and canned ourselves. We have 12 hens, a dog, and Rosie the cow's about to have a calf. I don't want you to worry about it, Bill. Everything's fine. Everything's fine, except it's very lonely for Corporal Sullivan's wife not having Corporal Sullivan. Joe. Joe. What's the matter? Hasn't he come yet? No, not yet. How is she? Oh, she's all right, I guess. It's so cold, though. It's 30 below. I'm afraid. Don't think of that. Is she comfortable? Would you be? No, of course not. Poor thing, I wish there was... We've done everything we can, Taffy. She's in the back parlor, the warmest room in the house. In the back parlor? But where is it? They're upstairs. Oh, I wish hard would come. Everything's ready. I have every pan in the house filled with hot water. I wish he'd come. Don't worry, he'll come. Did you say you took the hens out of the parlor? Yes, they're up under your bed. All twelve? Plus one egg. It was warm in the parlor. That's nice. Where's Eloise? Asleep. And the doll? Asleep with Eloise. Why as hard? Stop it, Taffy. Oh, Joe, I feel just like it was me having the calf. Taffy, you mustn't get excited. Cows have calves every day. Just remember, every cow is somebody's mother. Thank the Lord you've come. We've been so worried. We hey, didn't... now, slow down a minute. So the body can get his ulster off here. Ah, yeah. uh, now. Now, what's troubling you ladies? It's Rosie. What's wrong with Rosie? She's having a calf. Oh, bleeding angels of mercy. I ain't gone and left my chine back at home. But hard. Rosie's having a calf. You don't say. What's all them buckets of water doing on the stove there? They're for the base. Yeah, What? Well, in the movies, they're oh, always... The mo- <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Don't you laugh at me, you big piece of cheese. How can you stand there being happy and gay when at this very moment our cow hovers between life and death? Oh, life and death, Hogwash. Listen, without no help from me, Rosie will produce a full-grown bull. That's the kind of luck you darn fool women have. You two straw heads come up here not knowing a tadpole from, from the hind end of a whale. You plant enough garden for half a county. Now I'll be darned if a single cutworm bothered to eat one of your cabbages. Such confounded luck. No rhyme, no reason. But we read books on all those things. Oh, books, books. Why, I bet you a cord of good wood, oak, if you was to feed them hens of yourn caraway seed, they'd lay loaves of rye bread for you, sliced and wrapped up in celery paint. 
Rough, that's all it is. Just plain, simple, unskilled luck. And another thing... Wait a I... minute. What? Rosie. Oh, yes, we forgot about Rosie. Oh, hurry up, Howard. Maybe she's right in through here. Well... Hurry. Please, hurry. If anything's happened to her, I'll never... <gasps> Why, Rosie, you old angel. Well, look at that now. Can you beat it? Two of them. Twins? Twins, isn't it wonderful, Taffy? Rosie's had... Hey, wait a minute. Can a cow have twins? Dear Bill, it's January 13th, and our luck, as Todd called it, has run out. And so is Taffy. It all started several days ago. It'd been around 40 below ever since the calves came New Year's Eve. And the day before yesterday, we were all in the kitchen when suddenly Taffy burst out. Joe, I can't stand it. I can't stand it another day. Cows in the parlor and hens under my bed and the whole world frozen. Joe, I've got to go back to Atlanta. I've simply got to go back to Atlanta. Do you hear me? Oh, do you hear me? Kathy, I need a bucket of water from the well. Would you get it for me? I can't. There's no water in the well. It's ice. Ten solid feet of ice. How can you expect water in the well when it's 40 below? How can a you bucket expect... of snow, Kathy. Get a bucket of snow. Didn't you hear what I said? Didn't you? Kathy. I... Well, one bucket be enough. And that was the start. Yesterday, not a word was said. But this morning, Taffy turned up all dressed, ready to go out. Joe, I'm sorry. Taffy, don't go. I've got to. I'm sick. I'm really sick, Joe. Sure, you're sick. You've got a bad case of cracked morale. That's what's the matter with you. But stick around, Taffy. It's not a fatal disease. I see no reason for being flippant. I'm not proud of not being able to stand the cold. I took a lot of things in the beginning, if you remember. There were many times when I cheered you up. Well, how about a smile for baby now? Joe, you're insufferable. The trouble with you is you, you like to see people miserable. You like to see them agonized, tortured. Wait a minute, Taffy. The world is full of people like you, the ones who won't pay the asking price, the ones who want a band playing while they work. So the novelty's gone from kerosene lamps, has it? The novelty of playing the gay young heroine is departed. All right, go home. Go back to Peachtree Street to the Magnolia Blossoms. That's right. Go on. <laughs> don't cry, Joe, please. Joe, please don't cry. So Bill Taffy's been gone for over an hour now. She marched out to the barn with her little bag and her head in the air, and Eloise and I are quite alone. We'll make out all right, I'm pretty sure. After all, I'm, I'm strong and healthy and capable, but I'm so lonely. I, I should be able to manage, but... Hello, Joe. Car got stuck. <clears throat> it did? Down by the bridge. I tried, though, Joe. I really tried. I don't want you to think. I know. You cold? Oh, no. I. I. Joe. It's all right, Taffy. It's all right. No. No, listen, Joe. I, I just got frightened in it. Well, I guess I ran for cover. But now... Joe, may I come back? <clears throat> I, I, you, Taffy, you know what I was thinking? It seems to me that we'll want to paint the house in the spring, don't you think? I was just wondering how a nice, even gray would be. With blue blinds, say. I think that would be very nice. Except... Except what? 
Well, don't you think a lovely fight with green blinds would be better? White and green? Oh, I think that would be wonderful, Taffy. And then if we have any green left over, we could paint the flower boxes. Yeah, and if we had any green left over, we can paint the flower boxes. <laughs> and if we have any white left over, we could paint the... <laughs> you know. Oh, sure, do. <laughs> we can paint that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, here we'll stay, and we'll keep poking at the fire and hoeing the garden and writing letters, common, ordinary stuff. It's nothing to shout about. But when the bells ring, all the whistles blow, and your ship comes steaming up the harbor, soon, my darling, it will be soon. We'll be there in a gay and handsome bonnet, our arms wide open, and then I'll, I'll take you back to Horstroff for a swing in the hammock. And I'll feed you a bowl of raspberries, yellow with Rosie's golden cream. And you'll think what a lucky girl I've been all along. And, oh, darling, you'll be right. I love you, Bill. Joe. Thank you, Shirley Booth and Helen Clare. Now, here is Ted Pearson speaking for the DuPont Company. In the final scene of our cavalcade this evening, the two gals they left behind were planning to paint their farmhouse when spring came. And in real life, that's probably just what they'd do. A clean new coat of paint inside or out does make a house more cheerful. The hardest job of all for the women of America who are waiting so gallantly for the men to come home is keeping up their own spirits, their own morale. Taffy in our cavalcade play said she liked white paint. The DuPont Company makes a white paint that has special advantages for a farmhouse in Maine or a bungalow in California. It actually cleans itself. Now, even though this self-cleaning house paint is now available in limited quantities only, we want you to know about this self-cleaning feature. Ordinary white paint gets dull and gray after a while as dust and dirt become embedded in its surface. But as DuPont house paint gets older, it develops a fine, almost invisible, chalky powder on its surface. Dust and dirt, instead of becoming embedded in the paint, rest on the top of this chalky powder. Then along comes a good rainstorm, and the powder washes away, carrying the dirt with it, and uncovering a new, clean, white surface underneath. Your house stays nice and white for a long time, unless, of course, it's kept from the sun and driving rains by dense shade trees or is located in an extremely sooty industrial community. Constant research has enabled paint manufacturers to supply you with good, long-lasting paints in spite of wartime shortages. While DuPont self-cleaning house paint is available in limited quantity only, it still gives you the long-lasting protection and good appearance which won so many friends for it before the war. Back of this accomplishment are the DuPont research chemists and their years of experience in formulating high-quality finishes. They've exposed thousands of painted panels to test them in all kinds of weather. They've painted test houses to find out how these paints stand up in actual use. The good wartime paints offered to you today are the fruit of this research, typical of the painstaking work that brings you the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. Next Monday evening, Cavalcade presents the story of Canine Joe. Based on factual reports of the part played by dogs in this war, our play is the humor-filled account of an unpredictable collie named Joe who gold-bricked in training but became a hero in battle. In this evening's Cavalcade cast, Parker Family appeared in the role of Hod and Patsy O'Shea appeared as Eloise. The Cavalcade orchestra and musical score were under the direction of Donald Worries. This is Roland Winters sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company of Wilmington, Delaware. The Cavalcade of America came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.